Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, webinar today. Um, the, the, the goal for today's webinar is we're seeing more and more engineers running Solution 400 nonlinear analysis. And uh, I'll just make, show you a few representative examples of that. We're seeing people running large displacement analysis, geometric nonlinear. And sometimes we're post about link, we're showing this green box example. Um, a lot of people are running contacts, as shown with a latch example here. And <clears throat> some of the users are, are combining all three, large displacement and contact plus uh, metals plasticity. And all of these three types of problems have one thing in common. They're nonlinear, so it's going to take multiple load increments and multiple iterations to solve them. So it, it takes longer to solve in a simple linear analysis job. So our goal today is we want to show you like how to help you get to that first converged solution faster. And we'll show you uh, not only your defaults and some of the techniques that will get you there faster. <laughs> so you see this wonderful message at the end, job converges for the current step much faster. So uh, today what we'll do is we'll briefly review the three types of nonlinearity uh, in the context of nonlinear solutions. Like how, how, how do, how do, how do a pack of these nonlinearities to get to the solution faster? We'll discuss a few important concepts in nonlinear iteration. And we'll show you the smart defaults in solution 400, along with the dedicated patch on user interface. And at the end, we'll show you a few more useful diagnostics to help you when your job does not converge. So very briefly, what is solution 400? Um, Solution 400 is our uh, multi boot discipline nonlinear solution, which combined a number of solution sequences into it. It started out with the traditional nonlinear solutions, 106, 129. We brought in the heat transfer, 153 and 159. Uh, we brought in the linear solution, that's important because in solution 400, you can actually run individual subcases with linear analysis, but you can also chain them together. I can run a nonlinear analysis, a preloader structure, and run a linear analysis, a linear perturbation. We brought in mark components. This is important. Things like contact, a right? very powerful capability, already very mature. We simply brought them in by mark to integrate them into mass trend. Uh, new features continue to come in. We have new things like uh, flexible glue contact and so on. We continue to add them into solution 400. And we bring in new components, for example, micromechanics in composites. That being added, integrated to Solution 400. So very quickly then, uh, Solution 400 in terms of geometric nonlinear, already it supports all everything. Uh, large displacement of rigid body elements, push elements and your connectors, C fast, C weld, they all rotate with large displacement. We also support beam and shell offsets, which are very important in, in, in kind of element modeling. They also support uh, geometric nonlinearity. Material-wise, very large material library, and we support user material subroutines and Digimon micromechanics support. Uh, down to condition-wise, we fully support 3D contact, touching and glue. And, and very quickly, you want to be able to chain these analysis together, one after another, or do a linear perturbation, or you can do coupled thermal and structural analysis, or you can even run multiple independent subcases all independent nonlinear analysis or all independent linear analysis. So that was a quick overview of solution 400. So let's look at a, a brief review of three types of nonlinearity. Geometric, material, and contact nonlinearity. Let's look at geometric nonlinearity. By definition, geometric nonlinearity means whenever we have large displacement, and, and that includes both translations and or rotations, when either one or both are large. Um, let me demonstrate this with a simple cantilever beam. Uh, this beam is being, being loaded, and in this example, you can see if we solve this with a traditional linear analysis, we assume small displacement. So we, we do the equilibrium at the undeformed position. So in this case, I can solve this problem in one shot. Right? One, one matrix decomposition, one solve, because it's linear. But if the displacement becomes large, it no longer makes sense, right? You look at this displacement, you know it's not plausible anymore, even though you can solve it quickly. 
Uh, here's the animation of the actual deformation, and you can see it's not correct. However, if I turn on large displacement formulation and solve this as a nulling analysis, now you can see now I solving this problem, and I'm solving it, we'll discuss later, incrementally and iteratively. So I, I need to break this problem out into increments so I can follow the deformation and I can follow the change in load distribution if the problem is being solved. Okay, another example would be very typically post-buckling example. I have a shear web here that's going through shear buckling, and you can see right, after it buckles, the load path changes from shear into diagonal tension. So this is an example of geometric nonlinearity where we can't solve this in one shot. We have to break it up incrementally. We need to follow the deformation as, as well as follow the, the changing load path inside the structure. Uh, just to round things up, we also have follower force. In this case, the force is following the deformation. Again, we need to solve this incrementally in a nonlinear analysis. In terms of nonlinearity, if you want to get into, um, like this same curve here for so aluminum, for example, you want to push the material beyond the yield point. Um, well, it's a nonlinear analysis because we have to calculate in mass transportation 400 the equivalent stress. Once we calculate that, we come to this curve, we look up the equivalent string. So you can see we have to work our way incrementally up this curve as a nonlinear analysis. <laughs> If you model something like rubber, elastomers, similar problem. It's nonlinear, but very, very much larger strain. Um, and if you do composites, progressive supply failure is showing this example here. This is a open hole tension coupon. I'm just showing the, uh, the zero degree ply. You can see here the supply, the members are progressively failing and changing load distribution as the failure progresses. So again, another example of material nonlinear. Okay, the third type is compact nonlinearity. Let's look at this. For example, this is a latch assembly. You can see parts are in contact. So this is a contact problem. Shown here on the right is a little bit different. It's a track going through rollers. So you can see the, it's going through quite a bit of large sliding. So both problems are compact, but we, we need to tackle them differently. I'll show you smart debuffs later. The one on the left is much simpler. There's only no coming in and out of contact. Well, on the right-hand side, I need to watch out for the large displacement, large sliding. So it will take more load increments, for example, on the right-hand side. Uh, commonly in contact, we're coming with both the preload. So for example, this example, I'm preloading the joints. Uh, this needs to come in as multiple load steps. I need to first preload the joint, then I apply the external load. Shell elements can also be in contact, as shown in this example. In our latest example, um, capability in mass trend uh, just came in, is beam contact. You can see here, I have a stiffened panel, I have contact of beams with shell elements. Uh, it can be glued or, or touching, but the difference here is the beam element, in this case, mass trend recognizes the entire cross-sectional profile, so that entire Z section can be in contact with the shell. Okay, so now that we have a good feel for the three types of nonlinear editing um, available in Ashton, let's look at how we solve the iteration problem. Okay. Okay, now Farnas has me on a better uh, audio device. Let's hope for hopefully this comes in better. Okay, uh, for nonlinear iteration, then you can see here, here's a simple load deflection curve, right? Um, if I solve a linear problem, in this case, it's a constant modulus, a constant slope. I can solve this in one solve really fast. Now, if I have something like this, right, it's a nonlinear representation. It's a very simplified representation, by the way. This is a one-dimensional, one degree of freedom plot. Your real structure, right, has lots of degrees of freedom, thousands and hundreds of thousands of nodes. So uh, this is simplified down to a single, a single degree of freedom to explain the concept. To solve this nonlinear curve, though, I can't just do it in one shot. I have to break it up. So first important concept in nonlinear iteration is load incrementation. This example, I'm breaking this up into two load increments. 
So in the first increment, I applying the overloading, and you can see here, initially I calculated the initial tangent stiffness. And then I found out, wait a minute, it doesn't quite match. External low and in, internal loads don't match, there's a residual. So this is this R1, the residual. So I'll make another iteration with a new slope, a tangent stiffness, and try it again. Now the residual gets lower and lower. So the second concept is iteration. I iterate and iterate until the residuals <laughs> become small enough. And then I can take the next increment, right? This time it's shown in blue and iterate. So the three important concepts in nonlinear iteration, so number one, uh, load incrementation, how I divide this up. I could have divided this, this up into five load increments or even 10. The more increments I have, right, the, the flatter that curve gets, and it's gonna converge faster. Second concept is this iteration. You can see here, each iteration, I'm gonna make a decision. In fact, the user needs to. How do I calculate that tangent stiffness? Right? You can see here, I can, with every iteration, calculate a new tangent stiffness, and I'll get there a lot faster. That's called the newton raphson method. But I could also say, I'm, I'm not going to calculate the tangent stiffness every time. Just keep on using the same slope. I'll still get there, it's gonna be slower. That's called a modified newton raphson We'll talk about this later. But solution 400 for, for speed for efficiency will always use the full newton raphson which means every iteration we recalculate the tangent stiffness. Okay, the third concept is the residual, which we talked about. But there's that imbalance. That's important. You, you get to decide later on how you set the threshold of tolerance. How small does that residual need to be before you say it's coverage, let's move on. Okay, so also when you look at load incrementation, uh, you may want to decide, for example, if this example here on the left is pretty mild, fairly flat. So we can say, well, I only need three, four load increments to solve it. You have something more severely nonlinear shown on the right here. Um, you can, number one, looking at the red dots, right? I can say I want to put in 50 increments uniformly, and that will capture the nonlinear behavior. Or you can say, follow the blue lines. You can say I want to solve this adaptively. So tell the program when things are very quiet, very flat, take a big step. When things get very really highly nonlinear, trim back to smaller steps, all right? Both approaches are available. Um, so MSE spent a lot of time developing this uh, nonlinear iteration approach we're going to introduce to you. But for some of you who have used this in the past, we want to give you a brief history here. Um, over, in, over the years, MSE has used NL PARM and NL STEP, I'm sorry, NL PARM and T-STEP NL for static and transient nonlinear analysis. And we have NLPCI for arc length. And we have NL adapt. So a little bit later we learn more and say, well, NL adapt it will improve upon NL PARM and T-STEP NL. And finally, based on lessons learned, feedback on our users, we really sharpened our technique and our latest, and we recommend NL step, which has replaced all of the above, um, which was introduced in our 2010 timeframe. So NL step is the most robust nonlinear analysis method that we recommend that you use. The, uh, what it does, well, it's gonna help you decide, well, you decide the step size, convergence criteria, and stiffness update. Right? These are the three things I mentioned earlier. The step size is the load incrementation, the convergence criteria is based on the residuals, and the stiffness update strategy is, you know, how often you calculate that tension stiffness. Okay, it can be used for fixed or adapt, and you can do static and transient all in the same uh, method in our step. And we can do mechanical, thermal, and couple thermal mechanical. And finally, you can use this uh, technique in both solution 400 and solution 101. Okay, um, for those of you who first, you know, if you look at NL step in the quick reference guide for the first time, it's pretty daunting, right? If you look at this, I, I feel sorry. When I first look at this, I just say, you must be kidding me. Look at how many entries it has. Lots of knobs and dials and switches. It is very, very powerful. So it's, uh, 
where do I start though, right? We, we don't want you to really spend hours and hours and turn yourself into a nonlinear analysis expert. That's not the intent. We're all engineers, we want to solve the problem, and nonlinear analysis is just one of the tools, right? So we really put a lot of effort into simplifying this interface. Um, so our users told us, look, we don't want to spend hours tweaking the knobs and, and the switches. Help us. So MSC uh, actually initiated a team of engineers and we tested hundreds of nonlinear models. And we came up with smart default in solution 101 and, and 400. In solution 400, which I will show you today, are smart defaults for iteration control. And for solution 101, we have uh, similar smart defaults, but they're only for contact. So the, the benefits really, we want you to be able to use it easily, easy to set up, and fast convergence. So the, uh, I'll show you a little bit of NASTRAN entry, uh, just, just so you, you, you kind of know where it is, and then we'll go into the graphical interface and set this up. So you have three choices when you go to the NL step under the control definition field. You can choose Q linear, right? This is good for small displacement problem with contact being the only nonlinearity. This one will solve really fast, but with a very thought single step. Mildly is good for general problems. Anytime you have geometric material and contact nonlinearity, mildly is a good starting point for most of your problems. Severely, we're going to, you know, when you get into trouble when things don't converge or when you have very really large displacement and large strain, um, go ahead and turn on severely. So look at the NASTRAN entry here. Uh, you can see the NL step entry. And this time, without showing you that the, the, all the other continuation lines, you can see if you use the smart default, there's only one field you need to define. You pick curlinear, mildly, or severely. And then you can decide, right? You can see these two examples, whether I want to attack it with fixed increments or adaptive increments. Okay. Okay, now let's look at, uh, let me dive, let's dive a little bit deeper into the smart defaults. Let's look at Q-linear. I think Q-linear stands for quiet. I'm not too sure about this. Let's say it's just so quiet. Things are relatively quiet, Q linear. Uh, it's good for small displacement with contact nonlinearity. So if you think back at the some of the examples I showed you earlier, the latch example, or multiple bodies in contact, where displacement is small, but parts are coming in and out of contact. That's perfect for this problem for this setting. It's not appropriate for the sliding one where I show you a track going through rollers. There's a lot of large sliding going on, a large displacement, and that wouldn't be appropriate for Q-linear. So if you look at the defaults, we learned that you don't want to waste your time doing a whole bunch of iterations. Take a single load, load increment, 100%. Either fix or DT mid means the initial. Right? If you do it that fast, that fast, you also put in 100% at the beginning, single load increment. NASTRAN will very quickly iterate and get you the solution. Okay. Let's look at a few things which I will introduce shortly. But the convergence criteria we're saying PV. Right? P stands for load, V stands for vector. And here's the, the magical number where we, you know, where you had to decide earlier how, how small the residual needs to be. Right? You need to set a threshold. This is a threshold. We set it for you. We set a threshold at one uh, a tenth of a percent. Okay, I'll explain this a little bit later. But it's relatively tight. 10 to the percent on the residual load. And the method is pure full Newton Raphson. So we're going to recalculate the tangents distance at every iteration so we can get there much faster. Okay, default, you didn't specify anything. The default load setting is fixed, <laughs> but you can change that to, to adapt. It's great for contact analysis. Okay, let's look at the next smart default now, mildly. I mentioned early, earlier that mildly is good for general nonlinear problems. All right. Um, let's look at the defaults now. Now we're going to take, if you use fixed increments, 10 increments. I'm going to divide it up piecewise so we can get there faster. <laughs> if you do the uh, adaptive low stepping, you're starting from 0.110%. 
And then that's how it goes through and figure out adaptively whether to increase or decrease the, the load, load steps, the load increments. Okay, we still use the convergence criteria of load, but you notice now the residual ratio now is 1%. Right? 1% is a very good, we think overall, uh, residual load, load factor uh, for, for general nonlinear problems. And again, we do full Newton Raskin. Default is fixed. So this one we'll look at more detail later. Mildly is good for general nonlinear problems. Starting out with geometric nonlinearity, you can add material plasticity and you can add contact. Works very well with all these. Okay, by the way, when mildly doesn't converge, it doesn't mean you jump to severely right away. Okay, uh, for example, I'll show you an interface. Even though you select a mildly, you can go in there with mildly, you can override some of these defaults. For example, you can say mildly, but I want to take 20 increments or 50 increments. So you can do that very easily and just rerun the job. But going to severely, okay, when, when there's severely nonlinear problems, what we do now is when we first go to 50 increments, or if you do it adaptively, we'll let you start with 1% initially and then change the load increments adaptively. And now the other things are all the same. Same PV, 1%. Um, we throw in a little bit of a magic secret sauce here. N out is equals to 2, okay? This is, this tells Nastram when the uh, tension stiffness goes negative, right? If you have some softening in your structure, the problem is having trouble. For this iteration, let's skip the differential stiffness calculation. Let's skip it, for, skip it for one iteration, get it through the rough spot. Okay, with this, it often gets you through a rough spot. Maybe things is actually buckling or something to cause the structure to, to cause you problems. So with this setting, um, you can tackle more severely nonlinear problems. Large displacement, very large strain, or multiple contact pairs. Okay, now what if you left it blank, right? If you left it blank now, you can see it's 50 increments. But look at that. The residual uh, load factor is 0.1, 10%. All right. We'll define that for you briefly, but think about it. For those of us doing stress analysis, right, sometimes you're getting down to a margin of safety of 0 0.1, 0 0.01, right? So this 10% is probably not very comfortable for a lot of the uh, stress analyst. So, in fact, don't use this blank default. Right? This is an old default. Um, we've learned over over the years that you really should you want to use one of the smart defaults. Don't use this one. This is too loose for 10 percent. But as usual, we don't remove the old defaults because we respect our customers. We don't want their models to change when we run it. So we continue to keep this same blank default, but we recommend you use one of the smart defaults. All right, Hatran interface, we made it very simple for solution 400. We've created a dedicated Hatran interface for solution 400. Now, why do we do that? We could have, you know, we could have continued with our structures interface and just made the nonlinear phase better. But the regular Hatran structures nonlinear interface needs to support solution 400 and 600. So, so it tends to be confusing. You, you see things in solution 600 showing up in that interface confuses our users. So we embark, embark on a brand new solution 400 interface. It's very easy to use and it's dedicated to solution 400 only. Right? Only things you need are, are kept. Others are filtered out. So there are two ways to do this. When you start a new patch and database, simply select, select for analysis type, select and put the nonlinear. Instead of the structural, you usually select. Now, if you march along and you want to change reference, preference, for example, later on into this new nonlinear preference, or if you open up a patch and database that's already in the older interface, no problem. You can simply go to preferences analysis and switch the analysis type over to implicit nonlinear. Okay, let's look at the patch and interface. Like I mentioned earlier, we really made this simple so uh, it helps you really get to the, your analysis quicker without spending a lot of time trying to decide what the, the setting should be. So 
from analysis, no steps, set parameters, no increment parameters. I won't show you the interface, but you can get to this panel very easily. Load increment parameters. Okay. There's the three de smart defaults are shown here. Right? So I can set it to Q-linear. I can set it to mildly. I can set it to severely. And notice, as soon as you set the choice for one of the smart defaults, we show you what the settings are. Here's one increment, 10 increments, and 50 increments. Uh, if, like I said, if mildly didn't work for you, you know, if I have trouble converting 10 increments, you can come over here and change to 10 to 20 or 50, while still keeping all the other important default settings for mildly. Also, for increment type, you can change from fixed to adaptive or even adaptive arc length. Okay. Now let's look at uh, a very important concept here now, how to reach a convergence solution. When your job doesn't converge at the end, right, what's happening is the residuals are too high. So let's revisit this curve down below, but this time let's focus on these residuals, R1, R2, R3, R4. Um, management can treat them as unbalanced loads or unbalanced displacement or unbalanced energy. They're all available for you. More knobs and switches and, and dials for you to choose. But for the smart defaults, we simplified it. Right? We only offer you load. So it's, so it's these reduced, the reduced are now unbalanced loads. Right? You can see them. So that's going to decide, all right, depending on how small these unbalanced loads are. When we get small enough below the threshold, the iteration has converged. Okay, just to show you that if you open up the pattern panel, you can see these are already selected for you because it's under the smart default. You can see load vector, load error selected, as well as vector components. Uh, let's dive a little bit deeper. Uh, this will help you later on, really, when things don't converge, to give you some idea why. So convergence is controlled via convergence criteria and error tolerance. So we mentioned earlier for smart defaults, uh, all these guys get the PV as a convergence criteria. P stands for load. So we're going to look at the load residual. B means vector. Okay, so the definition is we'll take the largest residual load vector component. Right? Each load, residual load vector at any node has three vector components. We'll look at the largest component. We'll divide that by the largest reaction force that's your component in node. All right, so, so, so the V is a modifier. V says look at the largest vector component, and we're looking at the load residual divided by the load reaction. Okay, so for example, in the mildly nonlinear example, we set the PV to 0.01, so that's 1%. That means when you take the largest load residual unbalanced load component divided by the largest reaction component, it cannot be larger than 1%. Okay. Again, this is where you see those uh, choices selected in Patran. So let me show you as an example. People often ask, you know, what exactly is Natran calculating? How, what is that PV? Let me show you. Here's an example of a wing box, right? So I have on the left-hand side a fixed. And on the right-hand side, I have a chip loading at the wing. So it's bending this upward. So as the solver goes through, that we specify PV, so R is equal to residual force, F is reaction force. So we look at the entire model, each node is going to have a little bit of unbalance by right, residual. That's just the nature of nonlinear analysis, it's that unbalance. We're going to go through all the nodes and look for the largest residual force in any component. So here you can see the horizontal component is 0.11 pound. Then we look at all the reaction nodes at the root here, in root. We found out the highest reaction force, 500 pounds in this axial direction around the root. And then Ashton will simply take a ratio of the two. So we came out with a 0 .0002. That is our residual convergence ratio. That number needs to be below what you specify. And we specify mildly. So the ratio was 0.01%. So this is good. This is uh, well below 1%. Okay. And do notice, this is actually, right, it doesn't matter what component is in what direction. We simply take the largest component and divide them. 
this is fairly strict compared to some of the other codes on the market. Some of the other codes on the market will go do an, an average uh, error calculation. The average audio residual forces divided by the average reaction force. We pinpointed the most critical error, so this is fairly strict, stringent criteria. Um, let's look at the actual mass trend printout to show you so you can see further what's going on. Here's the FO6 printout. You can see it actually tells you the maximum residual force for this iteration and no 297 degree of freedom 2 is 0.11 pound. And the maximum reaction force and no 4081 degree of freedom 1 is equal to 500 pounds. And we calculate that ratio for you. All right. So each iteration national is going to go through and make this decision. I'll show you in a bit how you turn on this print out because if we show you this for every run you make, you're going to have a gazillion lines of of information available. So by default, you don't see this extra information above. You only see the summary at the bottom here, the 2.21 e times 10 to the minus 4. Okay, people also ask, so, so I mean, tell me more about what is exactly is this residual force? Where do I actually see it? For those of you who run linear analysis, right, you, you can ask for the grid point force balance. You can do the same thing here. So for this iteration, I ask for grid point force balance. For linear analysis, guys, we always want to make sure the grid point force balance sums to zero, right? That's a good run. And look at this. It's really uncomfortable for the linear guys because you can see the total here is not zero at that grid point. It's 0 0.11 pound, all right? It's small, yeah. But if that's the nature of nonlinear analysis, okay? In this case, you can see the grid point force balance at that boundary condition is 500 pounds. When we divided these two, it's good enough. All right, so we're going to let this pass. So just to let you show, uh, residual load is actually a physically unbalanced force, which you can request to actually see in mass trend. Okay, now that takes us to the uh, um, portion of additional diagnostics. So we've shown you how to, how to set up the smart defaults um, and how to do the initial job, right? Um, so when the job doesn't convert, people always ask, what's the first thing I do? Okay. Um, I would say fo follow the, uh, the sequence of steps here. Chances are at the end, after you review these things, typically you may go back and maybe just make the increment smaller, right? When 10 increments doesn't converge, you may increase to 20 increments. Or you may do what we say, divide and conquer. If, you, if your job fails at, uh, say, 70% fails to converge, you may take a break it into a, a two, two low steps. First step, take it to a zero to 60%. Give it a chance to converge. And then the next 40% put in a much smaller load increment to let you get through, okay? But before you do anything and rerun anything, look at the diagnostics. First of all, the STS file should be your best friend. When you're running the job, you should open this up. In text pad or anything that allows you to see real time, this thing will get updated. So first of all, get the job finished normally. Here I finish the job, and I see the job exit code is one. And one, unfortunately, is abnormal termination. Uh, if you see a zero, that's good. It finished normally. So this job didn't finish. It didn't converge. How far did the job go to? You look at here, it tells me it's 0 0.59, 549, about 50, 55 percent the total fraction of the load reached, okay? What was the max displacement? That's something you definitely want to watch. If you have any problem with your constraint, your problem, or something's running away from you, uh, this will show up. So we can see here the max displacement is 62,000. Okay, not too bad. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. How about does it have a lot of cutbacks? Look at this column here. Cutback means bisection. Uh, every time the solver has a problem converging, it takes your low step, low increment, and divide it by two. So it's called bisection or cutback. So you can see during this last load increment, it's got, it did four. Four cutbacks had a lot of trouble. And does it have a lot of separations when you have contact analysis? You look at this column. In this job, I do have contacts. You can see not too bad, right? So a number of times, the nodes came into contact and pulled away. So, so whenever that happens, we have to recalculate uh, the, the, the tangent stiffness. So there are some no separations. 
how about the total number of cycles? Total number of cycles is 53 here. So you can see here, um, 53 means it performed 53 Newton maxims, right? 53 total ten, uh, attention stiffness calculation. So we did a matrix decomposition 53 times, similar to 53 senior jobs, but even more expensive than that. People would ask because every time you do a new iteration, you had to reformulate the elements that right? are in the new position. So element formulation also takes time plus the solve time. So this will give you quite a bit of clue on what happened here. Why did it fail? Next thing is you probably should look at the the message right here. It's a fatal error message. The dread of fatal error message 9032, sub DMAP nonlinear. This happens at the end of your printed FO6 file. So you will search upward. Uh, you can either search for fatal or diverge, and it'll get to a reason why it failed, right? Another quick way I like to do is search upward and search for the percent sign, right? That will get you the, the last load iteration. So here it says solution diverges for subcase, right? So it diverged, that's a reason. And then it tells you even more massive number of bisections or minimum time step has been reached, right? So this thing cut back, bisected a whole bunch of times. So a possible remedy would be to possibly uh, make the increment smaller, give the job more increments so it has a chance to reach convergence. Additional things you should look at is after running the job for a while, you might ask, what, what exactly did I choose? Did I use a smart default or what did I use in my job? Look in your FO6 file and search for solution control parameters, and this tells you exactly what you use. So this you can see here. I used an adaptive method. My initial time step was 10% and it's PV, residual load, 0.01, and 4 newton maximum. Okay, so that tells you what you actually did. Um, now the new iterations is very important. So while it's running, or actually when it fails at the end, search for the percent parameter. Okay, that will take you to the iteration history. Remember, the percent sign doesn't mean percent. It's just a way NASTRAN developed to decide to use the symbol to, to uh, at, the, at the first field of each line. So in the here, you can see 1, E minus 1, right? That means 0.1, all right? It has nothing to do with the percent. But come here and look for a lot of iteration diagnostics. For example, it tells me my load Error factor. These are the residual factors. The residual force divided by the total force. Look, it's very healthy all the way through. Right? Very, very small. Well below one percent. Okay. Max displacement is another thing to watch. If the job is running, this shows you more information than the STS file. The STS file shows you the, the largest number. Doesn't tell you what degree of freedom. This tells you in what node. At what grid point, what component, the degree of freedom, and the value. Again, gives you some idea if the job is running away from you. Uh, contact separations, again, something to look for. Okay, the next thing is um, when a job doesn't converge, don't, don't worry. Don't run right, right back and just say, well, let me just increase 10 increments or 20 increments. Before you do that, the failed job has saved a lot of good information for you. For example, if you remember from the STS file, the job failed at about 55%. So in the results in the pattern, look at the 55% value. So NASTRAN will save the results for the last converged load increment. Um, go ahead and plot the stress displacement and see if it's something that shows you. Is it an inadequate constraint? Is it, is it buckling? Uh, you may want to plot very quickly the max deflection versus low. Right? So in this case, I'm plotting. Uh, you can see the, the, the uh, displacement is decreasing as time increases. So this is geometrically stiffening. The job is getting stiffer. You can also plot a load versus deflection. This thing is slightly curving upward. So this is another way to really understand why your job may have failed, just by plotting the results available. Okay, and one last thing I want to talk about is there are some stubborn jobs. Sometimes you just, you know, a job just doesn't converge. The residual load factor, the, the, the ratio, kept on going above 1%. Um, 
or the contact kept on separating. Notes come into the contact and come out again. We can ask for additional uh, advanced diagnostics. I'm going to just talk about two today that are fairly useful. Uh, the case control command is NLOPRN, nonlinear output parameters. So here's from the quick reference guide. We're going to specify, I'll show you two different choices. First choice is we set NL debug to advanced debug. And the right here shown is uh, patch out will not let you select it, so you need to input this as a text input, direct text input into Patreon, or just take a text add to your natural input file. So when you turn on the advanced debugging, what we do is we show you, here we go, show you at each iteration what that worst residual is. So you can see here now there's something going on in node 297. That's the highest residual force. And the highest reaction force is, is at no 481. By the way, if you have contact, right, the contact forces now count as the action forces. So contact forces will show up at, at a, a denominator here. So you take the numerator divided by the denominator, like I showed you earlier, there's a ratio, all right? The reason I want to show you this is this will tell you what the trouble problem is, the trouble area. <clears throat> if it really doesn't convert, you know now, let's go investigate around mill 297, see if something's happening there locally. Okay, another thing you can do is you can ask for advanced contact output request. Right? If you have a contact job, the useful one is M3D advanced. Okay, this is when you have a job that is wasting that amount of time, separating, separating, separating. Every time a node comes into contact and separate in the same iteration, NASA will, will recalculate the tangent stiffness. So that's one more solve. So you may be wasting a lot of time and it's just not converging. This tells you, it's going to print now for this iteration what's going on, which node is contacting each body. And what's useful here is also showing you which node they're separating, all right? These may be your problematic nodes. You can see right away. Instead of just saying separation is occurring, now you see which nodes are separating. You can do a detective work and find out maybe possibly locally around these nodes something's happening and you can go back and correct it accordingly. Okay, so hopefully uh, this was useful today. So we started by showing you the three types of nonlinearities and we focused on, you know, how the, the important concepts in nonlinear iteration, right? How to divide up the node increments, how to specify the iteration, okay, and, and also the residuals. We'll show you the smart defaults, how you get started, and using the pattern interface with some helpful diagnostics. Hopefully this is useful for you to, to help you get to that first convergence message much quicker.